Christmas, church. It is good to be with you. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. If we haven't met, my name is Ethan Magnus, and I am one of the ministers here, and I am so uh, glad that you are here. We're talking about introductions uh, this month here, uh, and especially the introductions of the Christmas story. And, and we all know how introductions work. I just did one just now, right? I told you my name. I told you a little about myself, and then that when we've been introduced. And in a polite society, you would respond in the same way. So I'm going to give you a chance to be polite. On the count of three, you all tell me your name. Ready? One, two, three. Awesome. Okay, I missed a couple. I think I missed two of them, but I'll get them in the lobby later. But that's the way uh, an introduction works. And, and Christmas, the season of Christmas is just filled with introductions, right? We send our Christmas cards and we introduce our new pets. Or, or maybe, maybe you're, you've brought, maybe this is the year that you've brought a boyfriend or a girlfriend and you're going to grandma's house and they're going to get introduced to the whole extended family and it's going to be so awkward, right? And so brutal. Uh, last year, service, we had a family sitting right up here. There was a lot of elbowing going on back and forth. It was clear that that's exactly what was happening that the very service uh, yesterday, I mean, in the last service. So yeah, that happens at Christmas. We have to introduce uh, new people to whole crowds of uh, people. And sometimes our whole Christmas season can feel like a long series of introductions, right? Maybe this is the year that you had to go to your spouse's, um, you know, office party, right? And it was just the worst because you don't know any of these people, but you got to be friendly because you're pretty sure that, that the bonus this year rides on how friendly you are at the office party, right? So the pressure is on to remember all these names and know who all these people are. Um, this is, in fact, this is how I determine my level of fear when I go to a Christmas party. I, I determine my level of fear based off the number of introductions that I will have, right? So the, like, the easiest Christmas party is one where I already know everybody and everybody already knows me, like no strangers involved. Like, I'm okay, I'm ready for that. But then sometimes you go to a Christmas party where everybody is a stranger. You don't know any of these people. And this is terrifying, right? Because like you're going to meet somebody in the dining room and then you're going to walk off to get a drink in the kitchen and then you're going to see another person in the living room and you're going to be like, hi, my name's... And they're going to be, yeah, we just met in the dining room. Like I just met you. And you're, yeah, I know. I was testing you to see if you remembered me. I remember you, right? Yeah. But, but that is not the scariest Christmas party. The scariest Christmas party when it comes to introductions is when you go to a Christmas party, not where you know everybody, that's fine, or where you know nobody, but it's where you're supposed to know everybody, right? Like it's a party where you've seen these people before, you've met these cousins like a, a hundred times, but you don't know who they are. And they're, my wife and I did this a couple weeks ago. We got invited to a party and we were so glad we did. You know, we don't go out a lot. So we were thrilled to be invited. It was a wonderful time, but it was, it was, one, it was the scariest kind of party I go to where I don't know everybody, but everybody knows me, right? And so like, I'm gonna do the whole thing. And you know what you do when you have to be introduced to somebody and you're supposed to know your name, you do these tricks, right? This is, here's a trick I'll give you. This is one I do. They'll, they'll be like, hey, do you remember me? And I'll say, oh yes, I know your name. I just forget, how do you spell it, right? That's a great trick. And they respond, B-O-B. That's, that, I was like, yeah, oh, oh, B-O-B, -B. yeah, because, you know, there, there are options, there are options. I thought you were one of the other kinds of bobs. But anyways, we were going to this party, and it was one of these parties where everybody there was going to know me, and I was not, and I, I, just, I just felt my fear rising, because it was going to be dozens and dozens of complicated introductions. And then we walk in the front door, and, and I hear from across the house, I mean, I just hear, oh, I'm so grateful to the people who hosted this party because I heard those words of peace and freedom echo through the home. And some of you who aren't good with names, you know what I heard, right? It, just, I just, it was just love just kind of moving throughout the home toward me as I heard the host call out, don't forget, everybody needs a name tag. Yes! Christmas was saved. It was amazing. And not only that, but the host herself was writing all the name tags. So none of this illegible handwriting stuff. She was writing in great big block letters so everybody could read. It was a Christmas miracle. 
Um, because Christmas, uh, at least in my world, can be overwhelming by the number of introductions, which is sort of fitting because the Christmas story is itself an introduction. The whole function of the Christmas story is to introduce us to the person of Jesus. In fact, the structure of the story is structured as a series of introductions. We're introduced to Mary and Joseph and the shepherds and the wise men and Zechariah. And every time we get introduced to somebody new, the first thing they do is introduce us to Jesus. We're introduced to Mary. Very first thing she does is meet an angel. So we all get introduced to Jesus. We're introduced to Joseph. The very first thing he does is meet an angel. So we all get introduced to Jesus. We're introduced to Zechariah. And the very first thing he does is sing a song that introduces us to Jesus. This is the whole pattern of the text. Sort of like me at a party getting reintroduced to people I'm supposed to already know. This is the way the Christmas story functions with Jesus. And so if you were worried that you were supposed to already have Jesus figured out and you were supposed to understand Jesus completely, uh, take heart. The Christmas story is for you. Because what it does is reintroduce us to Jesus, the one we thought we knew but probably didn't know as well as we could have. And today we're going to find the same thing. We're back in the Christmas story to get introduced to a stranger named Simeon. He's not one of the A-tier Christmas stories. He doesn't show up at the manger. You know what I'm saying? It's not, he doesn't even rate above the donkey. Uh, but Simeon is in there. We're going to get introduced to Simeon. And just like all the other characters of the Christmas story, the first thing Simeon does is introduce us to Jesus. And I'm glad you get to meet Simeon today because Simeon is one of my favorites. We'll talk in a minute about why I like Simeon so much. But first, let's go meet him. Luke chapter 2, verse 22. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. What are we talking about here? Uh, well, the law of Moses says when you got a baby, uh, after a few days, you know, getting over all the exhaustion, you got to go to the temple offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving, and to consecrate your firstborn son to God. So they're going to do that, just like the Bible uh, commands them. Uh, verse 23, as it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And they also offered a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of dove and two young, or two young pigeons. By the way, this is how we know that Mary and Joseph were broke because that sacrifice, a pair of doves or two young pigeons, is the smallest sacrifice uh, suggested by Scripture. You could, they could have made bigger sacrifices, but it says, but if you're totally broke, if you're dirt poor, just find two birds, you can sacrifice two birds. Okay, that'll do. Verse 25, we meet Simeon. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. Well, like any introduction, we can learn his name, and then we learn some things about him. He was righteous, that means he made good choices with his life. He was devout, that means he was committed to God. And here's my favorite thing about him, we'll talk about this more in a minute. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. We'll talk about what that means. The Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah, the Lord's promised King. And moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms, and he praised God, saying, and he does just what every character does. Remember we said, first we get introduced to them, then they introduce us to Jesus. And that's what Simeon does. Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may dismiss your servant in peace. He says, God, I am ready to die. I could die happy, God, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, glory of your people Israel. And the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. This is, of course, the way the Christmas story works. We're introduced to a stranger, Simeon in this case, and then he 
introduces us to Jesus. And who is Jesus? He is the salvation prepared in sight of all peoples. He is the light for revelation to the Gentiles. He is the glory for God's people, Israel. And Jesus is, of course, the star of the Christmas story. He's the, the main event of the Christmas story. But, but Simeon is the star of this little chunk of the Christmas story. So let's talk about him for just a minute. I, I want to tell you what I like so much about Simeon. Uh, my favorite thing about Simeon is that he knew what he was waiting for. He, he knew that he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. Uh, the, the word that gets translated waiting here uh, is a concept that shows up several times uh, throughout the New Testament. Um, it doesn't just mean like waiting around for, like just passing time, just tapping on your watch, hoping it gets here, like you're waiting for a bus or waiting for a plane or something like that. It isn't trying to describe some period of bored time wasting. Rather, it means that he was looking forward to, he was living in expectation of, he was preparing for. This notion of waiting means he has organized his life around a particular future reality, and that future reality changes every moment of his present and every hope for his future. And in Simeon's case, the thing he was waiting for was the consolation of Israel, the healing of God's people, and the fulfillment of their purpose. Because, see, he knew that God's people were meant to be a source of blessing for the whole world. And he was waiting to see that accomplished. And of course, friends, that's still true. We are still, as God's people, meant to be a source of blessing for the whole world. Every city in the world that has a church in it is meant to be saying, boy, I'm so glad we have that church. My goodness, they're awesome. Boy, if we didn't have that church, I don't know what we'd do. Their, their existence is such a blessing in our world. And Simeon knew that about God's people, and he was waiting to see it accomplished. And not just passing time, but organizing his life in expectation, preparing for the moment when God would fulfill this hope through the person of Jesus Christ. That's what I like about Simeon. Which makes me wonder something. What are you waiting for? You know, not just lunch this afternoon or presents tomorrow, but, but what are you waiting for? I mean, do, do you know? Do you know what you are hoping for, dreaming for, working for, preparing for, living in expectation of? What goal, end, purpose, what future reality have you organized your life around? Do you know? It's worth asking. Because we know other people. We know other people who have organized their life around things that aren't worth it. It's sort of easier to see when we think about other people, isn't it? So, so do that. Think about somebody else for a second. Because we know people whose answer to that question has led them to lives of meaninglessness. In fact, has led them to lives of self-destruction. We, we know people who have ruined their lives because they have organized their lives around the wrong thing. Right? Think about people who have organized their life around their past. They are working for, living in expectation, preparing for the dream of somehow recreating a past that will never return. Some people do that when they organize their life around the good things from their past, right? If only things could be as good tomorrow as they used to be, we've just got to get back to that. You know people that have ruined their life because they've organized their life around some imagined perfect past. Sometimes we organize our life around the bad things in our past, we organize our life around our past trauma, right? 
I'm never going to get over what happened to me, what was done to me. We organize our life around our past mistakes. A person can do that. A person can build a whole life centered on one past mistake that they refuse to release and move beyond. When you see someone organize their life around the past, it is a tragedy. And it leads to a tragic life. A, a similar tragedy, though, happens when we organize our life around the present. You can ruin a life that way, too. Again, you know people like this. The, everything about their life, every, every choice they make, all, everything about their life is just organized around the present moment. You know? we, people even give this advice. They say, live for the moment, right? Live for today. The, the problem is when you add up all those moments, they don't add up to something that means anything. When we organize our life around the present, this is when we get, end up trapped by addiction that brings some momentary pleasure but long-term destruction. This is when we get trapped by video games and cell phones and screens that we're just endlessly scrolling, hope to find something funny enough to make that moment count. But then you add up all those moments and they don't somehow count, right? We see people who have organized their lives around present pleasure or present indulgence or present selfishness, and it just ruins their life. Even organizing your life around the future, depending on that future. Again, you know people who have organized their life around a dream. They built so much of their life around that dream that then when the dream didn't come true, they were devastated. Or when the dream did come true and it disappointed them, they were filled with rage at the whole world for not giving them what they deserved and had worked for. The Bible says that how we answer this question, what are you waiting for, working for, living in expectation for, longing for, preparing for, the Bible says that how we answer this question is a consequential decision. What you are waiting for, it, it, it changes your present action and it alters your future reality. I'll give you an example. Here's something I am waiting for. I am living in expectation of. I am preparing for, hoping for, dreaming for. I am waiting to sit on a rocking chair on a back porch holding hands with my wife when we're 90. I'm waiting. I live in expectation of that. I don't know that I'll get it. It might never happen, but I plan for it. And that changes how I live today. First of all, I'm trying to eat more salads and fewer hamburgers. So I make it to 90. But secondly, I'm trying to apologize fast and forgive quickly so that if I make it to 90, she's still willing to sit next to me. You see what I mean? What you're waiting for, expecting, working for, it changes your present reality. Young people, maybe you had somebody who told you that the thing you should be waiting for is, is to be wealthy. A luxurious retirement, right? That's what I'm waiting for. That's what I'm working for. That's what I'm preparing for. Well, that affects how you live today. And there are people who, they're, what, what they do for a living is they tell you how to live today so you can be wealthy when you retire. That's their whole job. And they will. They'll tell you all the things you do today so you have that future reality. Jesus says that's risky. He tells a story about a guy who did just that. He prepared for just that reality and then didn't live to enjoy it. And somebody else spent all his money. What you wait for changes your present, but it also changes your future. And I will just share here, I am concerned. I am concerned that some of us, if we were to honestly answer the question, what are you waiting for? What are you working for? What are you living in expectation of? Around what future have you organized your life? I worry that some of us are organizing our lives around things that ultimately will not satisfy. We organize our lives around things that end up being so trivial that they render our whole life meaningless and our future empty. I grew up in a, in a house, uh, we had rules in my house. 
Now, I hear rumors that some kids these days don't have any rules, but in my house, we had rules when I was a kid growing up. And in particular, we had a lot of rules related to breakfast cereal. Uh, that's not really true. We didn't have a lot of rules. We just had one rule, and it was very simple. The only breakfast cereals that were allowed in our house were Cheerios and Bran Flakes. That's it, you know? Raisin Bran, too crazy, right? Cheerios and Bran Flakes, those are the breakfast cereals that were allowed in my house, which meant as a child, uh, when we would go grocery shopping, I would walk by these cardboard boxes of cartoon magnificence and just wonder, what lay behind the cardboard there. You know, you just be, and you would see the ads on television. And some of you don't remember when we used to watch ads on television, but some of you do. This is in the, in the pre-internet days, there were ads on television and they would tell you what you should want. And I would believe them. I would want the things they would tell me to want. And what they told me to want were lucky charms. And oh, and I believed them. When they told me to want Lucky Charms, I did want Lucky Charms. And I began to live in expectation, in preparation for the future reality when I could buy whatever cereal I wanted. And so I'm not sure why it took me till my mid-20s, but I was out of the house and married and we, we had a house, you know, and I was doing my thing. And one day I was there in the grocery store and I was on my way to pick up Cheerios because I had been taught well by my parents, you know. And then I saw the, the Lucky Charms. And I realized this was my moment. This was what I had waited for, prepared for, and planned for. I could now buy whatever cereal I wanted. And so I bought the Lucky Charms and I went home and it was not breakfast time or lunch time or dinner time. It was just time, time for me to have a bowl of Lucky Charms. And so I did, I prepared, poured this huge bowl, got the 2% milk out of the fridge. I was ready to go and they were terrible. Like, oh my goodness, I don't know if you, Lucky Charms are horrible. It's awful. And if you're here and you love Lucky Charms, I will pray for you. I mean, I think that's the best I've got. I mean, it's not like I don't, it's not like I like you less, but I do respect you less. I mean, I'm just saying like, they're awful. They're horrible. And all that expectation, it, it was like when I got the thing for which I had waited, it was so useless, it trivialized all the waiting. And, and I, I'm worried that some of us are doing that with our lives. And I, I, I just, you know, just stop for a second. You, you could wait your whole life for something that won't even be there, you know. I know some people, they put their whole lives on hold. Everything about their life is organized for getting that perfect relationship, right? And once they get that perfect relationship, then everything will be great. And then they get that relationship and they discover, holy mackerel, this is hard. It's not near as perfect as I thought it would be. Or they organize their whole life around that perfect job with that perfect paycheck and then it'll all work out. And then they get it and they discover, oh my goodness, well this solves some problems. But it creates a whole bunch of new ones I didn't even know were there, you know. You know. Some of us are waiting for things that do not give meaning to our present and do not give security to our future. And the Bible says it matters what you wait for. This is what I like about Simeon. Simeon knew what he was waiting for. And what he was waiting for gave him purpose every day. It gave meaning to every day of his present and it gave security, reliability, and eternity to his future. And the Bible says that Simeon has it right, that it makes sense to wait for, plan for, live in expectation of, organize your life around a future reality that gives meaning to today and security to tomorrow. And this word, to wait for, it shows up again and again in the Bible, always calling us to wait on the mercy of God. Every time. It shows up in Titus. Uh, Paul writes uh, to a young preacher named Titus, uh, challenging Titus to do this thing, to live in expectation of the work of God. And here's what he writes. For the grace of God has, been, has appeared that offers salvation to all people. 
It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You see, what you wait for changes your present. And then he says this, while we wait, and that's the same word. It doesn't mean while we pass time or while we twiddle our thumbs or while we watch our watch. It means while we live in active expectation and preparation for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what, you go- what is good. What you wait for changes your present. What you wait for determines your future. When you wait, live in expectation of the work of God in your life, everything about your present becomes meaningful because it is organized toward God's purposes. And your future becomes secure. What was it Simeon said? Remember when he saw Jesus? He says, Lord, you can dismiss your servant in peace. We don't know if he died that day. But as far as Simeon's concerned, he could Because he's been introduced to Jesus. His hopes have been secured. He says, you you could dismiss me in peace. Because I have seen what you're going to accomplish through this one. And I wonder if maybe this is why the Christmas story is told in this way as a series of introductions to strangers who then introduce us to Jesus. Maybe we're introduced to all these people who then introduce us to Jesus so that we consider how do we respond when we're introduced to Jesus. Maybe we're introduced to Mary who is introduced to Jesus so that we too could respond with humble trust just like she did. And we're introduced to Joseph, who's introduced to Jesus, so we too could respond with surrender to a plan that we do not like. And sometimes we do not like God's plans. Maybe we're introduced to Zechariah, who introduces us to Jesus, so we too could worship a God who invites us to serve him with no fear at all. Wouldn't that be amazing to get to serve God with nothing to be afraid of? That's what Zechariah does. Maybe we're introduced to the shepherds who introduce us to Jesus so that we could celebrate God's salvation so loudly our neighbors would hear about it. And maybe... Today, right now, this morning, Christmas Eve, 2023, you're introduced to Simeon so that he could introduce you to Jesus and you could decide to wait on the mercy of God. Not twiddle your thumbs, not pass the time, but decide to organize your life, to live in expectation for, to begin to prepare for God to accomplish just what he promises through Jesus Christ. Build a life around Jesus such that every moment of your present have meaning and the whole eternity of your future is secure. That's what Paul commands Titus to do. Wait on the mercy of God so that every moment of your present has meaning and the eternity of your future is secure. And so I wonder again, do you know what you're waiting for? What is the reality around which you have organized your life? What goal, purpose, meaning, agenda, future hope has, has become what you're actively preparing for and pursuing? Everybody's waiting for something. Everybody is planning their life around some reality. Do you know what yours is? And is it worth it? 
Are you waiting for something? Are you preparing? Are you organizing your life around a reality that is significant enough? Because you can waste an entire life organized around something that ends up tasting like ashes in your mouth. And you discover that all that work of preparation was meaningless because the thing for which you prepared doesn't last. One more thing. This question, what are you waiting for? Uh, There's a second way we use that question. Probably the more common way if you hear it today. We say, what are you waiting for? When we say it that way, we mean, what are you waiting around for? Come on, we're like, get going. What would it take for you to actually get on the move here? What would it take for you to get started? What are you waiting for, we ask? What, what catalyst would be required for you to move into action and begin to take your present reality and your future hope seriously? And I guess I want you to think about that question too. What are you waiting for? Why the delay, right? You say, I want a healthy marriage. Well, then what are you waiting around for? Say you're sorry, apologize, offer forgiveness, go for a walk, get a counselor, adjust your priorities to put the other one. What are you waiting around for? Reach out to the church. We help people save marriages all the time. It's one of our favorite things. What are you waiting for? Or, or maybe you say, you want a life of significance, right? You want to go to bed on a Friday night tired, but knowing that your week mattered. Well, then what are you waiting for? Like, it actually isn't that hard to fill your day with things that matter. Go feed a hungry person. Go tutor kids in an elementary school. Worship God. Praise your father. Tell a friend that you care about them. Write a note to somebody who's sick and shut it. If, if you want a life of meaning and purpose, what are you waiting for? Go for it. God gives away those kinds of lives for free. God gives away lives of meanings to anybody who seeks it. Maybe what you want is a confident faith in God. And you're like, I know what I'm waiting for. I'm waiting for my questions to be answered and my doubts to be satisfied. I want the whole thing figured out. And if I had the whole thing figured out, then I would try trusting God. And God says, well, that's not the way it works. You find out a bridge is strong enough to hold your weight by walking across. God says, trust me, and I will prove trustworthy. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? What are you waiting around for? What better plan do you have than to chase after something that might just possibly give you meaning every day and an eternity that's secure. What, what prevents you from acting now? I mean, today's the day, right? Today's the day of salvation. Simeon sees Jesus. This is the day. Now is the time to put your life in Christ, to organize your life around a future hope so profound and so reliable that, that every day makes sense because of it. Jesus is salvation for all the people. He is the light for those in darkness. He is the glory for God's people. What are you waiting around for? And then one day, you'll get to say like Simeon, Lord, dismiss your servant in peace. I'm I'm ready to go. Because I've been introduced to Jesus. Jesus. And I have put my hope on him. I wait on him. And he will not disappoint. Let me pray for you. Gracious God, confront our lives. So much of our life is organized around the past that cannot redeem. Around the present that is so trivial. 
around a future that offers us no hope. Reorganize our lives around Jesus. Right now, God, there are those who need to hear a call to begin to wait on the Lord. For it is when we wait on you, God, living in expectation of your goodness, trusting in your promises, that's when our days have meaning and our future is secure. Call us to that right now and may those who hear your call respond, God. We worship you, God. Light in the darkness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.